Hello and welcome to our online services at Scotts Hill. My name is Phil Ortigo and I serve as the senior pastor. Normally, you would see one of our teaching pastors coming to you from the platform in the worship center. But for the next three weeks, we're going to change things up a little bit. Instead of seeing us from the platform in a worship center, we're going to invite you into our homes. We're beginning a new series today that we've entitled Neighboring. It is a very practical series that helps us to learn the art of learn, loving our neighbors well. And so we're gonna look at three specific areas during this series. We're gonna look at the heart for neighboring, we're gonna look at our home for neighboring, and we're gonna look at the hope for neighboring. Now I believe that God really wants to use this series in our life. And I believe that God has uniquely positioned the church today to be more effective at loving our neighbors than probably any other time in our lives. Let me explain this to you. I have in my hand a salt shaker, and I would say that every home that is watching today has one of these in your homes. Now the salt shaker is a wonderful little device because what it does is it enables us to collect a large quantity of salt in one location. And it stays in this container until we shake it out onto our food. Now, if we do not use the salt and remove it from the salt shaker, it's ineffective and it makes no impact in the taste for our food. The Lord Jesus spoke about this in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, it becomes worthless and only to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by man. A lot of times the church is like a salt shaker. It is a collection of saints who have been redeemed by God and are meeting in one location. And it is a wonderful thing for us to gather together because as we do so, we worship God. We learn His Word and His instruction of truth. We edify one another and build each other up. We sing praises. We grow in our discipleship. All of those things are wonderful. But if the salt remains in the salt shaker, if the saints remain in the buildings, we become ineffective in reaching our world. Now let's be honest, it's very comfortable in the salt shaker. It is very comfortable to stay in the Christian bubble instead of going out into a hostile world. But if we remain here, we are ineffective. And by God's providence, He has used a little virus called COVID-19. And by using that, He has shaken up the church he has changed the way that we have been doing church. And as God shakes up the church, He is closing our buildings and He is thrusting us and sprinkling us and causing us to go into the world. And yet it is here where there is effectiveness. And it is here that God is calling us to reach our neighbors. That's why I said that we are more positioned and more uniquely positioned at this time than any other time in the history of our Christian lives. That God has placed us as salt into our communities. He's put us as the ministers to our neighbors. God has driven us from the building and from our homes and into our streets so that we can learn to practice the art of neighboring. God calls us to the task of loving our neighbors. We see this both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And Jesus certainly spoke a lot about it. In fact, on one occasion in Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, Jesus was confronted by a legal expert of the law. And he was going to ask Jesus a question to try to trap him. And then he asked this question. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, Ask him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now, did you catch that? that Jesus said that there is no greater commandment than to love God and to love our neighbors. 
In this passage, Jesus speaks of our love flowing in two directions. It begins with the vertical direction in our relationship with God through Christ. We are to love Him with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. He requires our first love. But the overflow of my love for God should spill into the lives of others. And as I love God rightly, then I will love people rightly. Not only do I love in the vertical, but then I begin to love in the horizontal. And in loving in the horizontal, I begin to love people the way Jesus loves them. And the heart for loving our neighbors always flows out of my love for the Father. We see this in our culture. We see this in our world. The reason men and women hate each other, the reason men and women kill each other, the reason that children are aborted is because we don't have a right love for the Father. But once I love Him in a relationship with Christ, the horizontal relationships in my life are taken care of as I love them the way Jesus loves them. This past week, I wrote a statement down, and this statement really just shook my own, my own world. Here's what I wrote. The greatest testimony of our love is what we do with our love. We might say we love Jesus, but if we don't obey Him, we have given away the depth or the lack of our love for Him. We may say we love our neighbors, but if we don't respond to their needs and demonstrate that love in their lives, then we have given ourselves away in the really the lack of love. The greatest testimony of our love is what we do with our love. So how do we love our neighbors? How are we to love them in a way that we reflect the love of Jesus in their lives? Well, fortunately for us, the Lord Jesus gives us a beautiful picture of how we are to love our neighbors. And he tells this story in one of his greatest parables that he's ever told. Now, the same situation happened. A legal scholar came to Jesus, and he asked him the same question. And in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, this scholar comes to him to try to trap him. But this time, Jesus does it a little differently. Instead of Jesus answering the question, he turns the table and he asks the scholar to answer that question. And he does. He says, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then trying to justify his own life by giving away his lack of love for God and others, he asked the question, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus answers by telling an incredible story. And in this parable, beginning in verse 30 of chapter 10 of Luke's gospel, here's what we discover. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. This is an incredible story because in this passage, Jesus teaches us how to love our neighbors. And he gives us three simple points. They are so simple that we look over them many times, but they are so profound because they will change the way we view our neighbors. Here's the first thing that Jesus teaches us how to love our neighbors. If we're going to love our neighbors rightly, number one, we must see them. We must see them. 
Now, what's interesting in this passage and in this parable, we find that this phrase, see or saw him, appears three times. And for each person who encountered the man who was beaten and left for dead, each one of them saw him. But they saw him in a different way. For example, the priest comes along and the scripture says, and he saw him and went to the other side. Now, what did he see? Perhaps the priest, who is a religious leader of Israel, who was the one responsible for being the mediator between God and the people, how did he respond? What did he see? He probably saw a man who was beaten and bloody. He probably saw a man who wasn't going to survive. He probably saw a distraction in his own life that was keeping him from his agenda, or maybe a disruption in his life, that was keeping him from fulfilling the task of the temple. He saw a number of things. And the Levite, who was also a religious leader, he comes along. And what does the scripture say? And he saw him and passed on the other side. Now, what did he see? Maybe he saw a person who would defile him if he touched him because he might be dead. Maybe he saw a man that would cost him a lot of time and a lot of effort, but he went on his way. But then the Samaritan, who is considered the enemy of the Jews, who is considered a Gentile dog, saw him and he had compassion. He saw him differently than the priest, differently than the Levite, where they saw him from the external. The Samaritan saw something that was much deeper than what's on the surface. Perhaps he saw a man who was created in the image of God and of incalculable worth. Perhaps he saw a man who was a husband, who was a father, a man who was a son, a man who was a brother, a man who was a friend, a man who was a person. You see, the Samaritan saw much deeper, and he saw something that the others did not see. And by looking and seeing in this, Jesus is teaching us that there is a condemnation here, and there is a challenge. The, the condemnation is this. Those who should have known better never look past the external. And I believe the Lord Jesus is speaking to the church today. He's reminding us as people who should know better, we should not walk past people just looking at the external, measuring them up and going on. But here's the challenge. The challenge is that we are to see them. We are to see who they are. We are to come to understand that these are people who are created in the image of God. These are not just our neighbors who happen to live next to us. By God's providence, He's put them here for us to love them. These are not people who are just going to be evangelistic projects in our lives so we can tell them about Jesus so their lives can be changed. We don't love them to change them. We love them because we have been changed. And when Jesus tells us to love our neighbors as ourselves, there is no promise given that there will be a return on the investment. Some people may hear the message of this gospel. Some may reject the message of the gospel. But my task is to love them anyway. So how do we see them? We get out of our homes and we come and we talk to them. We get to know them. We hear their hearts. We hear their passion. We listen to the things that are really exciting and passionate in their lives. We hear their struggles. We sense their fears. We come to understand who they are. In other words, we see them. When I walk in my neighborhood, I see my neighbors. I see Rocco and Karen. They just moved here from New Jersey and her 90-year-old mother lives with her. I see Randy and Sheila. Both of them work in the medical field and they have been worn out these days because of this virus. I see Miss Laverne and Mr. Al. He's 88, she's 89 years old. I see David and Crystal and their two kids, Dylan and Isabella. I see Bill and Marie. I see the Halls. I see the older Halls. I see the Bradshaws, I see Mike and Sandra and Ruby Joe. This takes time to see your neighbors. It takes time to get to know your neighbors. 
and it takes a lot of effort to just come out and spend time talking with them. Now I know not everyone has that time, so we have a wonderful tool that we want to introduce to you that will help you to get to know your neighbors. It's called Bless Every Home. Take just a few moments and watch this short video. Raise up warriors, Lord, who will fight on their knees. We can use the technology of today and use it as a harvest tool to reach souls for Christ. And now we have this incredible tool, blesseveryhome.com. We're taking the latest consumer data and merging it with current mapping technology to pray for every single person in our community by name. Sign up free at blesseveryhome.com and you'll receive a map and list of your neighbors along with the tools to pray for them by name, care for, and share the gospel with them. The ease of use and convenience has literally taken away every excuse that we could possibly come up with for why we can't engage the Lord on our neighbor's behalf. There's also the ability to print out a list of names if you don't even have a computer. You can even highlight your pray, care, share journey with each neighbor home using the colored icon. Red means you are praying for that home. Yellow shows you know each other by name and you are caring for them. Choose green when you are actively sharing the gospel. Make the home blue when those neighbors are active disciples of Christ. Each neighbor home has its own journal. You can also choose to receive scheduled reminder emails with the next five neighbor homes to pray for that day. Your members will see their neighborhood in a whole new light. What are we waiting on? The harvest is now. Our prayer is that by the end of 2020, every single home in America is being prayed for by name. You'll never reach any more people than you pray for. If every believer would get behind Bless Every Home, we could see a revival in America beyond all we could hope, think, or imagine. Join Bless Every Home and see how prayer can change your community. Raise up a generation, Lord, that will take light into this world, that they will proclaim that there is salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. Raise them up, Lord, raise them up. Wow, can you imagine God raising up prayer warriors in every neighborhood? Can you imagine the people of our church impacting their neighbors by walking the streets, praying for them by name, seeing them and then calling them out by their names and have an opportunity to even let them know, hey, we're praying for you. If there's anything we can pray for you about, can you imagine how being involved in such a ministry can change the entire complexity of our neighborhoods. This helps us to see them. But Jesus doesn't stop there, does he? As he goes on, he teaches us that not only must we see them, but he teaches us that we must serve them. I want you to notice what he says about the Samaritan. In verse 34, he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Now, I want you to hear the depth of service that the Samaritan had for this stranger he knew nothing about. It says he went to him, which meant he stopped and he took time to observe the situation. He bound up his wounds which means that he tore strips of his own cloth, of his own garments, to bound the wounds. Pouring oil and wine, he used his oil to clean the wounds, his wine to disinfect those wounds. Then he took this stranger, set him on his own donkey, which means that he would have to walk the 17 miles to Jericho. And this man would be riding on his donkey. And he brought him to an inn which means he searched out a place to put this man up until he is healed. But he didn't just bring him there and leave him. He took care of him, which means that he spent the night, which means that he, he took care of this man and he nursed him back to health. This man was an incredible servant. This despised Samaritan not only saw him, but he served him. Remember, the greatest testimony of our love is what we do with our love. 
I got my introduction to my neighbors in a number of different ways. For instance, Rocco and Karen, I was introduced to them when they pulled in from New Jersey in a moving truck. And I went over there and spent the day helping them unload that truck. David and his son, my next door neighbors, came over as well. And they began to help and to serve. I think about the neighbors across the street, um, Mr. Al and Miss Laverne. Because of Mr. Al's business, he's gone a lot. And Mr. Laverne, who's 89 years old, is at home by herself. And during a number of situations, Chris and I had to take care of her. He got stuck in New York during the COVID and couldn't come home. And for a month, she was by herself. So Chris and I went over and we served her. We, we, we took care of her. We bought her groceries. When her electricity went out, we charged her phone. We took care of her. Our next door neighbors went over there after a storm and cleaned up behind them. I've had neighbors come and help me. I think of Lucio who came and helped me with my roof after a storm and with my gutters. Mike came and helped me and served me as he took care of my needs by helping me remove trees. And together we have served one another in this community. Now here's the wonderful thing about this is as I serve them, I never tell them that I'm a pastor. I've never told them that I was a pastor of a church. Why? Because I should be serving them whether I serve as a pastor or not. Because we love them, we serve them. But I want to tell you, in some cases when I'm serving them and they don't know I'm a pastor, some of them just curse around me. And and we'll be working together and they'll drop some curse words and I never flinch. I never change. I keep looking at them. I've heard it all before. I've lived on a golf course. I have heard my measure of cursing. In fact, it's all this cursing that caused me to want to stop playing golf, mainly my own. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding, just kidding. I haven't stopped playing golf. But we're called to serve one another. And we don't just see our neighbors, we serve them. We help with projects. We rake their yards. We bake cakes. We bring them brownies. We bring them filet mignon. Whatever it is we need to do to serve them, we have the opportunity to do so. You see, I not only see them, and I serve them. And why is service so important? Here's why it's so important. It is so important because when I serve them, I am building relational leverage with them. And it gives me the opportunity to do the next thing that Jesus teaches us to do. You see, we not only see them, we not only serve them, but Jesus tells us a third thing. We share with them. We share with them. This is exactly what the Samaritan did. And boy, did he ever share. Look at verse 35. And the next day he took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. It cost this Samaritan something to serve this person. But I want to tell you, by seeing him and by serving him, he had the opportunity to share in his life. And he held nothing back. The scripture says he took out two denarii. That would be enough funds to pay for an innkeeper's oversight of him for about a month. Can you imagine taking a stranger to the Hampton Inn and paying for his room for a month? That's exactly what he did. And not only did he pay that cost, but he told the innkeeper, listen, if there are any other costs that come after this, I want you to tell me. He trusted the innkeeper in his honesty and was willing to go beyond what he could do. Jesus tells us that seeing our neighbors and serving them is building relational capital in their lives. It's spending time with them that gives us the opportunity to speak into their lives and actually earns the right to speak into their lives. Many years ago, we used to do a thing called faith evangelism at Scotts Hill. And it was a door-to-door evangelism um, project where it was cold turkey evangelism. You knew that you, you didn't know these people. You just simply went to their doors and you shared the gospel. And many times the doors were shut and very seldom did anybody even respond to what we were sharing. And here's why. We didn't know them. 
We had no relationship with them. As far as they were concerned, we were just simply salesmen who had a product that we were peddling that they didn't even know they needed. And as a result, there was no relational leverage to speak into their life. But when I see people and I hear their heart and I serve people and they see the genuine nature of the love of Christ in me, then they will welcome opportunities to hear the truth about why my life is so different and what Jesus can do to them. As an example of this, let me tell you about Miss Laverne. Miss Laverne and her husband, Al, have a number of children. Al was gone. He was in New York again on business, 88 years old, on business, and Miss Laverne was by herself. And we had been taking care of Miss Laverne. She didn't know I was a pastor. She didn't even know we were believers. We've never shared anything with her except to love her. She came across the street one day, 89-year-old lady walking with her cane. Took her a long time to get to us. We saw her come and we met her in the driveway. And she began to share with us something that amazed us. She began to tell us about her 68-year-old daughter who is dying of cancer and how she was so concerned and her exact words were, no parent should ever bury their child. And Chris and I were amazed that she so opened up to us and we began to share with her and we just told her that we were going to be praying for her and if she needs anything, let us know. We saw a glimmer of hope in her eyes. Last night when I came home and I was taking my garbage can out of the truck, across the street was Mr. Al on a tractor. He's 88 years old. As he's on that tractor, I can see him trying to pull dead branches out of this big oak tree with a strap. Well, he couldn't reach the branches. He had a ladder, 88-year-old man trying to climb up a ladder to pull the branches down. I ran over there. I took that strap. I wrapped it around the branches by throwing it over them in the air and creating a hook and connecting it to his tractor. He backed up and we pulled that branch off. Then we pulled another branch off. I was thinking I had just taken a shower. Now I got to take another shower. I'm dripping with sweat. And as he's sitting there on the tractor, I look at him. I said, Mr. Al, I am so sorry about your daughter. And I'm so sorry that she's passed away. And I don't even know this man, but he began to tear up. He said, it's a hard thing to understand. And I said, I know. And I want to walk with you through this. And we're across the street. If there's anything we can ever do, you let us know. You see, what happens is when we demonstrate that we see them, when we demonstrate that we serve them, then the door is open for us to share the truth. We've also opened our own home up on Sunday evenings. We had a small group in here at one point, uh, young couples from all over uh, this geographical area. But we realized, Chris and I realized, that we're not even able to reach our own neighbors. So we took those young couples, and they've created three groups out of that. And we reached out to neighbors in our community who go to Scotts Hill. And now we have a group on Sunday evenings in our home. And the whole purpose for doing that is so we can reach this neighborhood with the message of the gospel. In fact, I want you to hear me well. That's our heartbeat for discipleship at Scotts Hill. We have a vision of one day moving all of our classes off campus into homes. Why? So we can have a place where people can come, feel loved, and hear the truth of God's Word. We're to love our neighbors. We're to love them by seeing them. We are to love them by serving them. We are to love them by sharing with them. Why do we do this? Well, the story of the Good Samaritan is really a picture of Jesus rescuing us. When you think about the Samaritan and you make the parallel with Jesus, you'll see a number of things of what he's done for us and for our own lives. Let me give you a few of them. Like the Samaritan, Jesus was an outsider and was despised by many. Like the Samaritan, Jesus saw us when others could not see us. Like the Samaritan, Jesus came before it was too late. Like the Samaritan, Jesus had compassion on us. Like the Samaritan, Jesus came to provide for our greatest need. Like the Samaritan, Jesus provided tender care. 
Like the Samaritan, Jesus paid a price that we could never pay. And like the Samaritan, Jesus provides for our future needs. We are the recipients of unspeakable love. And because of that, we are to be the channels of God's unspeakable love to our neighbors. He has strategically placed you where you are. Your neighbors are those that God has given to you to love, not to change them, but because you have been changed. And the greatest, the greatest testimony of our love is what we do with our love. My prayer is that as we continue to love on our neighbors, that we would learn to see them, we would learn to serve them, and we would learn to share with them. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you've just heard today the heart of Jesus for you. And I want to encourage you today to consider the incredible love that Jesus has for you. There's never been a time He has not known you. There's never been a time He has not loved you. Jeremiah says God has loved him with an everlasting love. And underneath are the everlasting arms. And by God's providence, He wants you to hear that you are that beaten, broken person on the road. And the Lord Jesus is the one who sees you. And He has provided everything you need for life and for godliness. Believers, may we take the opportunity this week to practice the art of neighboring. It begins with my heart. My love for Jesus should overflow in my love for others. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the way he loves us. We thank you, Father, for the challenge that you have given to us, that we have the opportunity to love people around us the way Jesus loves them. And in fact, Father, the way Jesus loves us. Father, may our motives be pure in all that we do, that we simply love people because you have changed our hearts and we see them as people of incredible worth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now before we go, I have one very quick announcement that I want to remind you of. And that is this next Sunday, August the 30th, we are going back to live services at 9.30 and 11 a.m. So go online and register for those. And we look forward to seeing some of you live. And we know that we'll see some of you from another home next week. And you will not want to miss part two. God bless you. Have a great day.